being a more confident and fearless knitter will make your other struggles easier because you'll have that mindset to pivot when you need to. In this episode of the Yarn Talk podcast, Margaret and I share some of our favorite knitting books of all time. Margaret has some great picks that include some classic books, as well as a few that I had never heard of myself. And I have a few that are personal to me, so I hope that you'll enjoy them. Let's jump into the episode. So, Margaret, I'm going to let you start this off and do i understand that we're not ranking these these are just these are just i wrote uh, when you said five favorite knitting books i was like these are the ones that i'm gonna these are the ones that have benefited me so much that i feel like they need to these are the ones i'd bring to a desert island you know so my first pick not ranked but just numerically is Barbara Walker's Stitch Dictionaries. Um, they're probably some of the first comprehensive stitch dictionaries out there. Um, they came out late 60s, early 70s. And while they're not, um, they're not written like a modern stitch, di stitch dictionary would be in terms of having a chart, clear line by line instructions, they're sometimes they are they look a little bit jumbled because they're written in a paragraph form, but the breadth of knowledge that she managed to put into these tomes is absolutely incredible. And I still go through them and say, oh, I hadn't thought about using this stitch off the top of my head, but I just get so, I get so inspired. I get so many ideas looking through these stitch dictionaries. I managed to make a great sweater for my mother-in-law using some of the stitches that I found in there just because they they inspire me and they're beautiful. The fact that someone dedicated so much time to making that is such an incredible gift to the knitting community. So I love those. So it's four in one. You get a you get an extra bonus three books. <laughs> yeah. And she actually wrote a fifth book that is all mosaic knitting stitches um excellent so um i i don't think i own that one either but she she actually is um kind of like i don't think she came up with mosaic knitting but she was the one that said like this is a thing and then compiled all of those stitches into a book um and so you see them here and there but she has sort of like the definitive tome on that. Just so many things, because she also, I mean, the, these are not the only books that she wrote. She wrote a fantastic book on top-down sweater knitting, about double knitting. Like she was just so knowledge and so prolific that she's just, again, like I said, an incredible gift to knitting knowledge forever. Thanks, Barbara. You're the best. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tearing up. <laughs> Yeah, I love those books myself. I have uh, a few of them. I don't think I have all four of them uh, of the Stitch Dictionaries. And I was quite surprised because my first uh, introduction to Stitch Dictionaries was completely different. Uh, so it was interesting to kind of see knitting, uh, writing from a, uh, like an earlier time, you know, and, and this approach that was a little bit more fluid and not so you know, uh, picture, stitch, chart, you know, and, and not Absolutely. really a whole lot of explanation as to like what the, you know, what else there is to the stitch. So I think there's also just an assumed amount of knowledge that you, the knitter are, she assumes you're bringing a certain amount of knowledge to the table and that's, uh, it can be a downfall and it can be a blessing. So it's very, sometimes you need someone else to help you sort of parse out what's going in there, but still just an incredible once you get what she's trying to say incredible gifts to the community and mary thomas is another uh she wrote some really great early stitch dictionaries as well um i think they were put up by dover books or something so they're like little skinny ones but again just a great i think they were from the 1920s or something hmm. i'm not saying like i focus a lot on historical knitting books because i don't actually but they're interesting tools to have if you're curating a collection. 
which you should, because I love books. <laughs> My day job, I work with books. <laughs> I should, I should have said, when my husband and I first got married, lo, these 10 years ago, um, we had to move pretty much immediately after we got married because we were going to Russia for three months. No big deal. Um, and we're packing up our apartment and trying to figure out what we can get rid of versus what we have to keep. And my dear sweet husband, who I adore, <laughs> said, well, maybe you can get rid of like some of your craft books. I think you have a lot of those and maybe you don't need them all. And I was like, I know you didn't mean to say something that will get you murdered, but it is, um, I don't think you understand that this is a curated collection of reference materials that I refer to again and again. So no, we will not be getting rid of any of my knitting books. Like maybe maybe we can get rid of some of the sci-fi paperbacks that you have read once and will never read again. And he said, yeah, I don't think I had an, or understood the, the impact <laughs> of these books. And I was like, good, good lad. Let's, uh, let's rewind and pretend this conversation never happened. So I am a curator and a collector of these books and he's never tried to get me to get rid of one ever again. I have gotten rid of some, but not because he asked me to. <laughs> it's a good smart job, man, Beth. Man very smart i think it was just like hold up this is very early in our marriage to be making dumb choices <laughs> i was like oh still so I'm a sweet innocent boy <laughs> so i was having uh, a meeting with trisha malcolm who used to be the editor-in-chief at vogue knitting and she was telling me about meeting barbara walker and uh that I, I think that they did an interview with her or something like that to celebrate her, you know, some big anniversary. Iconic, iconic yeah. knitter. And I guess they had like connected so much that when she passed, I, I think this is how the, the story went. When she passed, she sent all, Barbara Walker sent all of the swatches that she made for the books to her. And Trisha just was laughing because they were all in like black and like neon yellow uh, because they needed to be like really high contrast, high contrast for the camera yeah because the, uh, the whole book is in black and white so all the pictures are in black and white and you would think that that's probably not like the the best but when we made our stitch dictionaries i actually knit all of the swatches in gray because I wanted people to focus on the stitch pattern and not be like, oh, I like this stitch pattern because it's teal and I don't like this stitch pattern because it's, it's green. avocado green, it. yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, when people complain about that, I'm like, look, like, that's not the point. Like, the point isn't for it to be a beautiful piece of color. No. <laughs> the point is you need to be able to clearly see what the stitch patterns look like. So, and I, I did that because I heard that story about the, the knitting treasuries from Barbara Walker. You can totally, yeah, you can totally understand. It would show up on camera. That's certainly true. <laughs> so why don't we take turns? Absolutely. You'll do one and then I'll do one. Okay, so I am also going to recommend a Stitch Dictionary, and this is mostly because it's just a personal uh, significance to me, which is the Harmony Guides. So these were produced by Interweave, and uh, I, I'm not saying that they're the best dictionary, Stitch Dictionaries out there, um, but they are beautiful in their own right. Um, there's, I think, a collection of four of them as well. They do lace, cables, knits, and I think they also do like edges or something. Um, but I don't remember exactly. They're, they are uh, curated by Erica Knight. Um, and so she kind of became one of my heroes because when I was starting doing the, the knitting stuff, um, I got w the Cables and Aaron's Stitch Dictionary for Christmas uh, from my mother-in-law. And going no pressure, through... just jump into Cables. <laughs> yeah. 
Like so I know going, your mother-in-law. That's so that's so nice. And also just like, no, it no pressure. You're good. To <laughs> so um so I, I so it for me it just has this kind of like personal meaning of it was the first knitting book that I ever really owned. It really opened up my eyes to what was out there. And then, you know, as soon as I was like, oh, like, you know, this is a series, like I want to get all of the books in the series. And, you know, eventually I got to meet Erica and she's like a fabulous, like lovely English woman. Um, I even su surprised her at, a, uh, she was doing a launch for her yarn for a collection in London. And I happened to be there and surprised her. And she was like, you know, that looks a lot like Johnny. And I, cause I didn't like go up to her. I was just kind of like chilling in the, in the yarn store. And, uh, and cause we had, we had met at the, one of the conventions, you know, mm -hmm. before that. So, so she knew who I was and uh, yeah, she was like, so thrilled that uh, happened to be there and, and was able, was able to, uh, to connect with her. So hopefully we're going to get her on the podcast pretty soon. Oh but, my gosh. Um, but yeah, she's a, she's a lovely woman. And so I have like kind of these multiple connections to that series um, uh, of books. And I, I'm not even sure that they're really in print anymore, um, but you can still find them on Amazon yeah. uh, and, and use bookstores. Like they're, they're a decent introduction. I would probably recommend a different stitch dictionary if you just wanted like a solid stitch dictionary. Um, but if you want something that is beautiful and simple, they're, they're pretty good collection as well. I love that. Yeah. The person that you got to, that you got to meet her and they were so important that just, it warms my heart. <laughs> All, All right, right, so what's your next pick? My next pick is another Stitch Dictionary. It's um, by Andrea Wrangle. It's called Alter Knits. Um, it is color work specific. And um, the reason I really came across Andrea Wrangle, that sweater that I had made for my son while he was in the hospital, that was a pattern of hers that I had gotten. And I said, oh, well, this woman obviously knows how to rock a stitch, uh, color work stitch pattern. It is such a thorough discussion of how to balance if you're using um whether you're holding both yarns in one hand and or the other hand or one in each hand how you can make sure that your stitches look balanced the color that's supposed to pop is popping the way you want it to do it, it i learned so much about just how the yarn is behaving in color work that if you, if you're me and you focused a lot on say lace and cables and not color work things for a really long time, you just kind of weren't thinking about these things. But I learned so much about this. Uh, I mean, once you get into color work knitting, there's so many doors that open as far as design possibilities that I had just kind of said, well, that, that's not going to be worth my time. So that was really nice thing to just sort of bust your brain open and the the patterns are beautiful and a lot of the patterns are like funny I love humor in these things so she'll have you know a bunch of little frogs all over or dogs of different scale or bicycles like things that I would not necessarily have so it's a modern stick dictionary including it gives you these options to um I actually had a friend who was talking about including some bees in an ornament that she was making and I was like do I have the stitch dictionary for you <laughs> let me try and find you some bees and they're not you know I think a lot of designs like that in the past 40 years or so can have a specific very um cutesy design and these are like not necessarily the same patterns that you would get from 40 or 30 years ago they are they're updated and they feel fun and not necessarily country chic and stodgy. <laughs> so I really yeah, like it. Definitely, it. Yeah. it definitely feels like a, a modern, like, as you said, like it, it feels like a, a modern knitters stitch dictionary. Now, 
just to make sure everybody understands this is a stitch dictionary in the sense that it shows like color work patterns. So it's all stock in exactly. it from what I understand. It's all uh, stock in it. And she's really great about sort of there are indexes in the book that say this has a six stitch repeat. This has a 12 stitch repeat. Mm. So, and how she gives a whole section in the book about how you can include these patterns in sort of whatever base pattern you're working from. And I think it just offers, it's not a recipe for a specific item. It is a, a, a dictionary and encyclopedia of possibility. And I think that that's a really exciting idea. So I think that's just, it it, it was important to me again, because of this connection to a difficult time in my life when my son was born and that she threw, took me by the hand and guided me through. And now I'm able to like let things explode. And that's really awesome. So I also have a book called Alter Knit with an S. Uh, and it is, uh, it's called Alternate uh, Imaginative Projects and Creativity Exercises. It's by uh, Leigh Radford and John Rizzo uh, and came out in 2005. So it's like five, six years before I really got into knitting myself. Um, and I remember we found this book at some... I think it was on sale someplace um, and we grabbed it because it was only like five bucks or something like that. Like it was like really, really cheap. Um, but it was such an interesting concept because it helped me think about knitting in a completely different way. So the idea behind the book is using unconventional materials and um, unusual applications okay so like one of the projects that she makes in the book is like a screen door um that's so that's, cool. that's knitted <laughs> you know and uh i think that she does some like knitted jewelry um and she also happens to use like unconventional materials like metal or leather or ribbon um and and i, I can't say that i love all or even most of the projects in the book um i feel like sometimes she's kind of reaching for something to do that's unique uh but it was more opening up what nitty can be and exactly. and showing like okay look you can knit with more than yarn and you can also knit things that are incredibly useful that aren't clothes or pillows or blankets and so I was just kind of so like, it's oh. form and function that are busted open in yeah. that. So, so in even, that if way. You can, even, even if you don't find all of the projects in there useful, it starts getting you thinking like, oh, okay, like, all right, what if I did this, but knit it instead? Um, and so um, I especially love the idea of knitted jewelry, I think is something that's just some highly underrated beautiful stuff absolutely yeah. um yeah there's even so i don't know is the knit jewelry knit with metal or is it knit with yarn and worn as jewelry i, do I don't know not, if you I recall don't i don't remember and i'm trying to pull up the like the patterns from the book uh right. i was just thinking about how i was um just watching a a video from an origami jewelry artist talking about how there's such a dominance in the jewelry space of metal. And one of the things that she says, so she's like, that's why I focus on paper, because I think there are so many things that you can make beautiful jewelry out of that don't, doesn't have to be metal. And I think that's a really fascinating idea. So I love, I agree with you. I think people need to give other materials a chance because <laughs> yeah, you can so come she up with some beautiful things. Absolutely. So she does uh, uses silver wire nice. to knit like like a swatch necklace. So like little squares. She uses uh, paper. Um, I'm what? not sure how she makes the paper, but I am I guess like a twisted thing maybe or yeah, it may be like crepe paper. That's uh, interesting. Um, I I know that you can get kind of like like paper rope. 
Mm -hmm. um and so she knits some paper lanterns oh out of gosh. that she uses ribbon to make some um some different items she uses leather uh to make like a a wrist cuff um and I'm so have to yeah look there's this like that a, sounds really cool and then she has a follow-up book called alternates felted and it's all felted projects as well um so again i don't think that the all the projects are like great in here but it's more just the idea of, you know to to try different types of things and different types of yarns that i really connected with in this book that sounds really cool i'll definitely have to look it up a different alternate um so i'm gonna i'm gonna dive in with my next one knitting without tears elizabeth zimmerman the og the elvis of knitting um for those of us who, who, who might not know, Elizabeth Zimmerman um, was a knitting designer and writer starting, I think she started designing commercial patterns for like Vogue knitting in like the 40s or the, no, it must have been the 50s because she was, she's British, but moved from Germany in the 40s because you would want to move from Germany in the 40s um, <laughs> to ooh, um, Wisconsin, started writing um knitting patterns and one of the things that she really didn't like was that people were changing her construction in her patterns she liked to make things circular using circular needles not flat and seamed and she would make these yoked ski sweaters for example and they would she she was like i have the sweater it's on the cover of the magazine and then i flipped to the instructions and they had completely changed my instructions so that it was written in two pieces and for the front and back and sleeves and sewn together which is not how you make a yoked ski sweater so she got so frustrated that she published her own magazine it was a pamphlet that she would send out to people um and this is her first book she wrote several books her daughter Meg Swanson is still running the company along with her grandson, Cully. Um, but this was one of those books that, uh, again, when I was when I was young and just trying to learn how knitting worked as an art form, they're incredibly chatty and informally written. It sounds like just a buddy is sitting down with a cup of coffee and saying, well, here's how I do it. And maybe it's not for you, but you should give it a try. And just this uh, incredible breadth of knowledge about the percentages of how you put together the idea of a knitting pattern, how to make something that fits your body if you don't necessarily have a straight size pattern body. She's like, here's, you know what you could do? Pick your favorite garment, measure that, make your own darn pattern. And that's so freeing when you don't necessarily feel like all of these patterns are gonna fit you. That was just a, the idea of warm hug writing combined with incredible knowledge is just chef's kiss. Absolutely beautiful. I love her. But just, and she's just was such an incredible gift as far as, uh, you know, breaking people's brains about what form could be used in knitting. Because she actually talks about how, um, she doesn't, she couldn't sew. Sewing was not what she did. And she's like, tailors are incredible people and in that they can take something flat and make it fit a three-dimensional form. And she's like, we are so lucky as knitters, we don't have to trick something flat to be three-dimensional. Let's just make it three-dimensional because we can. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's incredible. Absolutely. And the, her concepts, because that book is not really, a pattern book it's more about how do you approach knitting um while she does give some sort of frameworks and some guidelines for what's knit and those concepts uh, have been really influential in like our sweater knitting boot camp is Absolutely. based heavily on her original sweater percentage uh guides and the difference that you know i wanted to do with the boot camp is take that, okay, how do you make something uh, custom for you and and break it down to its most basic like options? Because a sweater then, can still be so overwhelming to people. And when you're like, no, but if you just break it down, 
you got this. You yeah, got this so, every step of the way. So our, our innovation is, you know, okay, but we're also going to like, we're, we're going to be like, okay, but you just have to knit this much today. Plus and a lot if, of her, her stuff wasn't top down too. So that's a really, that's a nice, because I think when you see top and you see progress right away, instead mm -hmm. of saying, I have to do a whole torso before I get to where I'm going. Yeah. So I really, it's, she was just such a great jumping off point for so many people in this Absolutely. industry. And the other thing that I really took from her is this idea, she doesn't frame it this way, but the whole idea of knitting without fear literally plays off of the idea of knitting without tears. Exactly. Um, and so um, to me, they're, they're one in the same concept. I'm trying to kind of update that uh, with our what, with what we do at Yarnist by talking about like, okay, the, the same ideas, really. It's, 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 okay, it's not that hard, but, you know, you need to think about it in a different way. And, uh, and, you know, all of these knitters for, for the longest time didn't even use patterns. So, you know, I want people to have the confidence to be able to go, ah, okay, I understand knitting on a level in which one, I don't need to like use a pattern in order to make the thing that I want, or I can adapt it to exactly. what I need. Uh, with confidence because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. confidence truly is key when it comes to all of this stuff like the confidence that even if you screw up you know how to fix it like that is I think that is the biggest that is such a huge gift is when you uh when you have the confidence that if it goes wrong you can adjust that's I, it in every area of life <laughs> It's not just knitting. Being a more confident and fearless knitter will make your other struggles easier because you'll have that mindset to pivot when you need to. That's just my philosophy. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I fully agree with you. Okay, I want to take a break real quick from our conversation, but we'll get back to that in just a minute. But I want to tell you about The Yarnist, which is our daily knitting email magazine, which comes out every Monday through Friday. In it, you're going to get a quick little article to help you learn about knitting and think about it in ways that maybe you haven't already. Sometimes we have articles about different kinds of yarns, like why alpaca is a good alternative to wool or why wool is so important as a yarn material itself. We talk about things like different ways that you can use stitch markers or the importance of Elizabeth Zimmerman and her effect on knitting in America. We always try to end things with something a little bit funny in order to brighten your day. It's a quick and easy way for you to become a more fearless knitter in about five minutes a day. Now, the best part is that this daily knitting magazine is completely free. All you have to do to get yours is go to yarnist.co and enter your email to sign up today and you'll start getting it right away. All right, let's get back to our conversation. So my next pick is another Stitch Dictionary. And I promise that I, I think we're probably done with Stitch Dictionaries. Yeah, I think I'm with Stitch Dictionary specifically. <laughs> yes. Um, but one thing that I think people will notice is our picks are almost not none of them are pattern books uh for the most part and I, I think part of that is because once you reach a certain level of proficiency in knitting you're really looking for resources that provide you sort of tools and frameworks or inspiration to help you do other things versus you know finding a book of patterns that you just want to knit over and over and over again. Because I find that pattern books in general get dated very quickly. Yes. And so, you know, there's a reason why like people aren't knitting patterns from the seventies anymore. Uh, or if they are, it's a deliberate choice. <laughs> it, it, yeah, I am making sure. a seventies sweater. <laughs> it's Absolutely. not, it's not just an easily wearable thing. So this book is uh, 
called Up, Down, and All Around. And it, it's actually, there are two books. There's one, The Knitting All Around, Stitch Dictionary, and Up, Down, All Around. They're both by Wendy Bernard, um, and they came out in like 2015, 2016, 17, around there. And uh, this is, again, another like pretty modern looking Stitch Dictionary. But her innovation here, and this is a question that I get all the freaking time, is how do you take a stitch pattern and make it usable in the round? And like for most stitch patterns, you just take the wrong side road and you basically um, invert it, right? So if it's a knit, then you do a purl. Um, that works fine for a lot of stitches, but it's a little bit more complicated when you get into things like lace, and even some cable, not cables usually, because cables almost always have a, a pearls on the wrong side. They row. have a rest row. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so you just knit that instead of purl it. Um, but there are some stitch patterns where that's not so um, straightforward. And what yeah. she does in this stitch dictionary is she shows 150 stitches that are knit from the bottom up like you normally do. She also does it so you can knit it from the top down uh, so you, that you can knit it flat and how you knit it in the round. And so she has three or four different ways to knit the same stitch pattern to get a similar or an exact look, exact match of those. So it's a very useful stitch dictionary. Um, and if you have both of them, then there's 300 stitches there that you can work with. Uh, so I, again, uh, there are so many times when you would want, if you're, especially if you're designing, uh, to be able to go, okay, this part I need to be done in the round, but I want to continue this, this stitch in, you know, let's say in a section that's flat. And so you have to completely rework how the stitch pattern works. So to have a resource where somebody's already done that work for you, muy bueno. Absolutely. And I think part, so you're talking about, yeah, when you're designing something, I think that it's worth saying that that doesn't mean these are just resources or for people who consider themselves designers. This is sure. for, so specifically if, if for our, our viewers and our listeners, if you're thinking, I just want to try, I want to dip my toe into this. A tool like this stitch dictionary is a really helpful way to start. Being like someone, I'm not blindly grasping at trying to do something all by myself with no help. People are here, they have hands that are reaching out saying, I have tools for you. And that, so I think that it's a great way to introduce yourself. Maybe you don't think of yourself as a designer yet, but you can do this. And even if you get a little bit sidetracked, again, you can learn how to, how to adjust and keep going. And it's going to look cool. Well, I have, a, you know, I have a, a, another uh, training on, it's called the Hat Design Blueprint. And it's my framework for designing hats. And I, I basically, you know, I, I view it like it's a coloring book, you know, and you have your shape of a hat and then you color inside that shape to make your hat. And a lot of, I would say half of my students in that course don't even want to be designers. They exactly. just, they're like, oh, I like, you know, making blankets or scarves, but I would also like to be able to make a hat that matches it. And so you know, you don't have to be a designer to want to be able to apply those things. Uh, but you, you know, you still want to have tools and resources that help you execute. Exactly. Those ideas. I, so I just wanted to say like, because we're bringing up tools that you can use for design, that doesn't mean that you should be at all intimidated by them. It's just, it's someone handing you a fully stocked toolbox so that when you get into your new apartment of a new project and say, you can fix things now. You can make what you want to make. And we wish you all the best. So that's one of the and reasons this, I think this is so feel, friendly. <laughs> yeah, this doesn't feel like a designer resource at all. I have a book that's like 6,000 sweater patterns. And it's literally- Was oh, so like, that the Melissa Leapman one? Yeah. And it, yeah, it's, it's like a textbook. Like, uh, you know, it's just charts and math. And like, it, it's like 
this for designers <laughs> like even I'm like, I'm not sure. Exactly. That I get intimidated by that one too. Yeah. It was like, yeah. oh, thank you, Melissa. But that's a lot. <laughs> and because <laughs> you can't scare me. You're not basic math. <laughs> All right. I was the next one that I was going to bring up was actually Anne Bud's. Um, oh my gosh, I have it right in front of me. Anne Bud's The Knitter's Handy Book of Patterns, which is again one of these, if you are feeling lost and you are not sure how to even start the idea of a pair of socks or a hat or a sweater. She's like, I have basic ranges of sizes and basic ranges of stitch gauges. If you're doing stockinette, here's a blueprint for you to play with. And I think that that's a really handy um, resource when you're just like shooting in the dark, I get clients who call me up and say, oh, I need a, I need a sweater post haste for my nephew. And I'm like, well, thank you. Um, I guess I will just get on that. Thanks. <laughs> and it's a really helpful thing to say, well, I'm going to tweak it in this way, this way, this way, but I have a blueprint to start with. So it's kind of a cheater resource for me is that it gives me a jumping off point to start. And I think that that's, I have to remind myself, it's not cheating to, you know, ask for help and that's, that's what we have. We have help. And Ann Bud is absolutely incredible. She ran in, she was an editor for Interweave Knits for a very long time. Again, one of these um, titans in the knitting world who has so much knowledge to share. And so thanks for sharing it, Ann. We appreciate it. Yeah, she has it. a ton of books like that, that are, you know. She has one for top down sweaters. She has mm -hmm. all these things, but this is just a really handy I'm taking a shot in the dark and I need to get something done book that I love having available to me. Where and again, I, I get weird requests fairly frequently and it's nice to have something that I can rely on. <laughs> That's my so, life. <laughs> <laughs> my next book, uh, I am, I debated a lot about like, what do, what do I think you know, I, I want to pick like smart picks mm -hmm. and then I also want to pick like just stuff that I like. Um, <laughs> and so rather than go the smart route, I'm, I'm going to recommend another book again, an, an older book. And the one reason why I recommend some older books is because like, I don't buy knitting books. Like I don't like use a lot of knitting books. Um, I don't like having things. And so, you know, you know, moving around all the time, like I, I was going to say nomadic lifestyle, it makes it harder to, to schlep some everything. Of these, yeah. Some of these books, you know, even to get the, the like PDF or the, or the ebook is it's, they're hard to use because some of them are kind of like dense, you know, I, I own like the principles of knitting in an ebook format. And that book I would is get like so lost. Yeah, yeah. It's like uh, it, there's so much information in there. It's like a textbook on knitting. Um, but I'm gonna go with another nostalgic pick for me, and this is "Knits Men Want" by Bruce Weinstein. Yes, so, Bruce. Um, Bruce is gonna be on the podcast uh, awesome. soon as well. And he was another one of these people who, you know, basically because I could not knit his scarf pattern, this herringbone scarf pattern, I ended up starting new stitch a day. Uh, <laughs> like I just need the help. <laughs> this should be available. Um, but, but because he kind of got some notoriety around that and he's also like a published cook, uh, a cookbook author, he was able to, you know, produce a couple of knitting books. And one of them was this book on men's knits. And it was kind of, at least at the time, the definitive book on, here are just some basic knitting patterns that guys will like. None of them are flashy. None of them are fancy. They're wearable. They're exactly. wearable. <laughs> Do you and know so, what a revelation that is? <laughs> and, and at that time, we had nothing. Like there, there just were not great knitting patterns for men. Now, you know, we at least have like Brooklyn Tweed, which puts out some men's collections on a relatively regular basis that we have some like nice patterns to work with because God knows 
there's still nobody really producing a lot of great patterns for men but um i gotta tell you it's even worse in the home sewing industry it is mm -hmm. impossible to find patterns for men's clothing and you're like there are so many men who would love to take charge of their wardrobe and create things that they love or people who want to make people things for men like that just provide the resource so thank you bruce <laughs> absolutely so um if you want a just a solid this is the only pattern book that I'm going to recommend, but it's because these patterns have this kind of timeless wearability to them. So, you know, your guy is probably going to be fine wearing those things if you want to make them for him. Absolutely. I think it's a fantastic pick. I, I love there's a herringbone color work pattern in there that I have used on hats and things for for mm -hmm. myself for Ben I think he's fantastic my last pick is Sally Melville Kn knitting pattern essentials it is not it's sort of the in-between ground between something like the Ann Bud book where you just get all of your instructions written out for a variety of sizes and one of those giant tomes saying, here's, you need a graduate degree in higher mathematics in order to figure out the math. Sally is another writer who's very conversational in her tone, but she's saying, oh, you want to make a sweater. Here are the mathematical formulas that you're going to need to figure out the how you're attaching a set in sleeve in your sweater, which feels impossible if you're like me and have dyscalculia. So the numbers jump around on the page at you. <laughs> it feels insurmountable. And she is so helpful in making it seem not scary. I think it is a fantastic resource, especially about necklines and how you can figure out your neckline depth. So you just just instead of having something that's necessarily plug and play where you can put it, put these numbers in and it's going to work out. She's saying, okay, well, that didn't work for you. Here's how we can make it better. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just such an incredible thing to do. She has some patterns in the book. She also makes some really unique design choices as far as here's what you can do with hems of sweaters. Here's what you can do with necklines. It's just a really nice all encompassing resource. So it's not there are some full sweater patterns in there, but a lot of them are, here are elements that we can figure out how to add to what you have. And I think that's just a, a wonderful thing. So it's that middle ground between someone has done 90% of the work for you and screw you, you're on your own. <laughs> you can, here's, here's math, hope you can make sense of it. There's something in the middle. And I think that that's an incredibly generous thing to have given us so that's what i like i'm well, using I gift a lot in here <laughs> <laughs> i i don't actually uh know that book uh at, at all but i can understand that you know again as we were talking about when you get to a certain level you you need to start having some more practical tools to solve specific problems and so those can often be hard to find if you're just doing a search online or something like that, because who knows if the, a designer wrote a blog post on that topic or did they title it right so that Google can help you find the thing. Thanks. Oh my gosh. And that's <laughs> how, am I, how I, am I searching on Pinterest? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So one of the reasons why having some of these resource books in your library is really useful is because you have an index that you can reference and you have all of those things there for you to be able to get to relatively quickly um, and that you can you know be like okay I know that they address this problem in this book so I, I have a place that I can go to to fix it. I'm not gonna lie I have so many post-it flags stuck in that book for just like I'm not going to remember how to do set in sleeve math, but I know Sally does. So here I'm just going to put it with a big orange flag so I can find it next time I need to do this. <laughs> and it's, so it might be it's, for 
a little bit more uh it's definitely a little leaders. but it is a great entree into i feel like i have a unique idea that i want to create how do i get that shape from my idea and i think that that is because i remember uh reading a book on fashion design and costume design and they said you know anyone can draw something can draw an idea for a garment it's kind of useless unless you know how to make it come to life how mm -hmm. do you what it, and so that is that is the beautiful thing that she's like oh that shape i've done that shape before let me show you <laughs> i've seen videos with her she's also really lovely and chatty and just warm it's a community of warm welcoming people gosh darn it it's like they want to share information with each other jeez <laughs> So I I love that book. I think it's a really helpful one. It's a great pick. What's, great. what's your last one? Okay, my last one is not so much a, it's another book that has some like personal meaning. And, you know, there are few books in the knitting world, which are sort of like the definitive thing on this topic um and also something that you know as i've been interviewing people all around the world uh that do, that do knitting um you start to see these threads that connect things you know you can understand that like okay fishing in the baltic sea spread certain kinds of knitting all over the Nordic region. Um, and very few people have done a great job at documenting those kinds of things. And on top of that, a lot of knitting books are pretty. Um, a lot of knitting books are not. Um, but there are not a ton of knitting books that are just drop dead gorgeous. Okay. But this is one of them. So yeah, I, this is uh, Estonian knitting and it is part of a, I think it's a three part collection of the history of Estonian knitting. And that it looks fabulous. It is this beautiful hardbound book. Uh, this one is called Traditions and Techniques. It's by Anu Pink, uh, Siri Reinman, and Christy. I'm going to mess up her name, but because it's in Estonian, but I think it is Ueste uh, is the way to pronounce it. Um, so obviously, this is important to me because I live in Estonia. Um, but Estonia has some amazing knitting traditions that are quite unique uh, around from other things around the world. Um, you probably heard of like Estonian lace. Um, and so this, this book is literally just goes through the, the years, you know, and the regions and, and shows examples of historical patterns. It tells stories about, you know, the people, and so it's, it is kind of an encyclopedia, but it's not the traditional encyclopedia that's just like, you know, here's a word that starts with A and here's two paragraphs about it. And it's also not necessarily this really boring, dry, you know, uh, book of, you know, here's, here, and now here is some examples of knitting Here from the 1940s. Note yeah. where the decreases are happening. <laughs> so, so I wouldn't say that it's exciting, but it's presented in a really like beautiful way. Um, and there are three of them. The, the third one actually is only in Estonian right now. They haven't finished translating it oh, into man. English yet. Um, but I, I got the first one as a gift for Christmas a couple of years ago. And I don't usually want things or books but i'm really glad 
that I have this one because I wish that there were more books like this in the knitting world. I wish that, and I don't know, maybe someday like that's something that I'll like pursue because I want to track these connective threads, you know, that show, okay, how did knitting kind of move from, you know, uh, you know, Mesopotamia kind of area up into, you know, the rest of the world and then you know probably like british kind of spread it around everywhere else um from there i can think but. of a, a couple of books like that i'd have to i'd have to do some more research but uh i robin hansen has a really fantastic city um series on mittens across mm -hmm. the eastern seaboard that mm -hmm. i absolutely adore that yeah just i think the sociology and history of knitting and the consequences that derive from those things are absolutely awesome so i i've never heard of this book i am so excited i want to go find one <laughs> they look so cool yeah it's a it's a really beautiful you have ignited uh, my inner nerd that was already a little <laughs> bit awake but like now fully awake so yeah th there's a couple of other books that are kind of like this Selvater uh is about like Finnish uh mittens and I, I did an interview with the um the author of that book um that will be coming out later this year and nice. um and that's a crazy story about how she ended up doing it but it was the same idea where she wanted to sort of document these traditional knitting stitch patterns that you know were kind of passed down within families uh, and everybody kind of had their own little like tweak and take on it. And she had so many examples donated to her that they could only like use a few hundred in the book, but she had thousands. That's incredible. Of, and they actually had to, they ended up doing a second book that was about other stuff. Cause the first one was just mittens. Um, and so, but I, I just wish that there were more of these kinds of books about knitting, because when I talk to people about knitting, you know, they're like, oh, you like they, they pretty much everybody thinks it's interesting that I knit uh, because they're like, you do what? Like, people um, find it less interesting than I knit. <laughs> <laughs> but when they're I like, also yeah, start that tracks. <laughs> But when I start to like point out that like, no, like knitting is an essential part of your everyday life and you don't even realize it, um, then they start to go like, oh, okay. Like there's some, it becomes about more than just, that's something that my grandma did when I, you know, like, but, you know, or I learned to do as a kid, um, but it's not something that I think about on a regular basis. And I'm like, sure you do. You think about it every day when you pick what socks you're going to put on. Exactly. Like, what, so. what are the comfortable items in your coat, in your outfit? They're probably knit. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and so I, I think books like this, be, be, like we need to document our history and we, and we need to, be, because there's so much of this stuff that's being lost. I remember I was in Bulgaria and I was, um, just walking through by one of the churches there and these old, you know, grandmas were knitting up these like really weird looking socks that I'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure someone has a, a some pattern on them for on Ravelry or something like that. But, you know, I'm like, okay, but wait, what if that's the only thing that represents all of Bulgarian knitting culture? Like, at, you know, yep. I, there's a, there's actually a similar, there's a YouTube channel called Pasta Grannies. Have you ever heard of okay. this? No. It is um, a film crew going out to find women in their 90s in Italy who have these uh, regional uh. pasta forms that are dying out. And they say, okay, so we'll film you and you can show me how, the, how you make that. And it is absolutely incredible because, you know, these women are living in tiny communities where there's not necessarily people to pass this down to, but because of the internet, because of things like this, they're able to share it with the world. And so there's at least a record that it existed and how it was made. And that's just so incredible. We Absolutely. live in a really cool time that information can be shared, darn it. 
Absolutely. Well, those are our picks for our favorite knitting books. If you have some of your favorites that you would like to share, you can email us at hello at yarnist.co. And uh, you can also find all of these picks on our website in the show notes for this episode. Give us recommendations. We want to know. Yeah. And if you also have any ideas for future top fives that you'd like to hear us talk about, you can send us an email about those as well. Well, that's it for this episode of Yarn Talk. Right now, I'm going to jump into the Yarnist Society, where I'll share a few bonus picks just for our members. And you can get access to that when you become a member of the Yarnist Society as well. All of our members get extended episodes of our podcasts, early access to our YouTube videos, as well as the opportunity to vote on future live workshops, knit-alongs, and a whole bunch of extra content to help you become a more fearless knitter. And when you become a Yarnist Society Plus member, you'll unlock all of our Yarnist Academy classes. That's more than 40 different classes that you can get instant access to today. Just go to yarnist.co slash join to get started. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you next time.